those are coming up real quick. Um, I met Jack Roser back in probably February, just after the primary of 2010. And his blue sparkling eyes and his honesty and just, he didn't know who I was. But I walked into his office and he treated me like someone that I, that, that, that I knew forever. Um, I am very privileged to work with Jack, and I've learned so much about our Illinois pensions and just how a lot of this stuff is really ruining our country. But I, I also have the privilege to, to speak with Jack very frequently. And, you know, Mr. Roser, you are a champion of the American dream. <laughs> listened to some wonderful speeches here tonight, and uh, I'm tempted to uh, touch a little bit on what each one of them had to say, because uh, there were some very important things said. Um, I'm a very old guy. I'll be 89 years old this month. Uh, yeah, my uh, intelligence quotient, my age, and my blood pressure are all the same now. <laughs> took a while. But uh, I'm, I'm so old that I lived through this whole communist conspiracy you heard about. And uh, it shakes me up a bit to think that it's, it's back. Uh, I've been through this. I, I knew about what they were doing. Uh, I had a wonderful father that I named my company after, uh, my father Otto Roser. Uh, he was in a, charge of a logging camp before World War I up in Wisconsin. When the IWW came down the railroad tracks to try to organize his uh, bloggers in there, IWW, that was the International Workers of the World, and they're still around. Uh, it also came to mean I won't work. Uh, <laughs> that was for sure. <laughs> I can remember listening to Father Coughlin. I wasn't listening, I was just there. But my father listened to the Father Coughlin program uh, and I heard about the international bankers and, uh, and so on. And in high school, I came home one day and I said, Dad, uh, they said something interesting, to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability. Uh, my father didn't hit me, but he straightened me out. That was communist crap. Uh, time moves on. And uh, the, uh, all of this stuff uh, that got started in the Cold War, uh, the commies came over here with uh, CPUSA, Communist Party USA. Uh, they never had the foggiest idea that they were going to win over Congress with CPUSA. They didn't think that at all. Uh, what they, uh, the Russians played a big chess game on us, They're chess players, and uh, they're patient. But uh, what they set out to do was to subvert the press the universities, and particularly the Democrat Party. That's, I don't call them Democratic, they're the Democrat Party. And uh, they succeeded largely in all of those things. I think the press was probably subverted maybe 90%. Not that they were traitors to the United States, but they uh, uh, picked up on all these socialist ideas. Uh, if you go back, uh, to uh, those years, uh, there were two factions that uh, worked on communism. And uh, there was uh, the Lenin type that said, the power comes out of the barrel of a gun. That's the kind of guy he was. Uh, you had, however, the Fabian Society in uh, Britain, and they believed that communism could be stuffed down our throats bit by bit. It turns out they were more right than Lenin. Lenin, uh, and has gone uh, kind of obsolete. But uh, the things of the Fabian Society, it was named after uh, Maximus Fabius, a uh, uh, Roman general 
that never fought a pitched battle. He believed in attrition to wear down the enemy. That's why they called it the Fabian Society. It had, I think, three uh, British prime ministers were members of it. Uh, yeah, uh, George Bernard Shaw, great humorist, great writer. He was a member. Uh, many other famous people were. And uh, the infection we got in this country was largely from the Fabian Society, which is a matter of gradualism of uh, taking over the American system. Um, shifted a little bit uh, to this business of small business. Uh, I've started uh, four businesses along the way. Uh, a guy hired me when I was 25 years old to start a business in aircraft switches. I did it. I actually, and I didn't know a damn thing about selling. I couldn't sell a magazine in high school. <laughs> and, but, uh, and I found out the task he put before me was a lot more daunting than he thought. Uh, he thought I was going to build a business around some aircraft landing gear switches made by uh, Lockheed Aircraft. Uh, this guy I went to work for was fantastic. Uh, he'd been the uh, president of Duesenberg and Cord uh, Motor Car Company. He was a director of American Airlines. He owned a dozen companies in uh, Chicago. His name was Harold T. Ames. And he was uh, uh, an associate of, uh, uh, what was the name of the other, not Otis, uh, Oh, I forgot. I forget names every now and then. But anyway, he was really a big financial shot. And uh, I went to work for him. He's a very tough guy. Uh, I heard him fire somebody and, ooh, the windows rattled. Uh, but he taught me something I've never forgotten in business and lived by. He said, uh, the, the fellow that complains to you is doing you a favor. Uh, the one that walks away is the one that hurts you. Uh, in a little different way, I... Uh, I take that to mean uh, that the guy who complains to you is giving you a free market survey. And uh, you want to satisfy, you want to find the fault. And uh, it isn't to seek blame, it's to cure the fault. And uh, I, I use that uh, in the other businesses I built. But uh, when I was 38 years old, I was determined to get into a small business. My father had, had uh, been in a number of small businesses that were failures until uh, 1937, he started the Roser Company in Millwork. My dad was kind of made of wood. Uh, he could tell you what valley the wood came out of, uh, looking at a piece of it. Uh, uh, my dad was large and uh, strong and funny and smart, and both he and my mother had eighth grade educations and a little business school, That's that was it. But uh, the remarks that were made here just a bit ago about the parsity of education we get in the present school system is true. Uh, my parents were smart. They, my dad could do square roots in his, in his head. Uh, my mother was uh, smart in her own way. Uh, she answered phone calls and wrote notes in Pittman, which was a shorthand famous, you know that, don't you? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but they were smart in their own way and our present system is nowhere near as good as it was uh, back in those days. Uh, I, um, I tell you, when I, went, when I started my present business, which was in 1961, and I started it with just $5,000, I'd already started two businesses, that first one, and then I made, uh, uh, went to Illinois Tool Works where I'd learned to be a dye designer, and uh, I started a new division for them in aircraft switches. I quit them in about, they're a nice company, but I was going to have my own company. And so in 1961, I started auto engineering. And I started with just 5,000 bucks, and I found it was moving too slow and I was going to starve. It takes about two years gestation period to do something in aircraft. And, uh, and so I started another business then in uh, machinery for mixing and applying epoxy adhesives. And uh, I, I uh, had to make a, a demonstration switch for Chicago Electric. They wanted just a small number, like 100 for some uh, spy recorders. And, and uh, I'm not taking too long, am I? You keep going. We're, you keep going. Okay. <laughs> Real good speakers. I understand Walsh, so. Joe Walsh is going to be here. Yeah, yeah I'm texting him. Good again. guy. But um, anyway, uh, I started making this thing, and, and uh, it became uh, a business of its own. 
And uh, within about the last 20 years, uh, the thing got up to about a million dollars in sales. That would be five or six million to, by today's dollars. And I sold it to 3M. And because uh, I'd gotten too busy with the aircraft thing, and my son Tom had joined me uh, after 25 years in my business. Uh, my wonderful son uh, came to work. He's uh, just a, a great engineer and a, a better manager of a bigger group than I could be. But uh, he said, Dad, uh, you got too much in your plate. Let's get rid of the machinery business, which we, I sold it to uh, 3M for uh, about uh, oh, three quarters of a million dollars and put the money back into auto. But all those years in, uh, in building auto engineering up, and I've got 600 people working in the most beautiful plant you can imagine on the Fox River. I've got 350,000 square feet of factory uh, that's built in 1870 uh, to make farm plows. Uh, 2,000 people worked in this complex uh, a century ago making farm plows. But uh, they went, uh, they left there and went broke. I, I bought uh, the buildings from them in three different steps, but. Uh, they were, they were intrinsically so beautiful, couldn't leave them alone. And uh, we, my, me and my son Tom has been terrific at getting these things done. Uh, and uh, now those, we bought it in three separate buys, but um, those buildings are beautiful. They're better looking than they were in 1870 because they're all, they all look like they're new, brand new, all at once. And they dominate that beautiful scene carved out by the Fox River and God uh, the, and the glacier. And they, they plowed through the most beautiful part of Illinois with the island and cliffs and islands. Uh, there's an American Eagle nesting within 100 yards of my office. I sit in an office made in 1870, and uh, it's almost as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I went through that whole thing, and I tell you, looking, looking at the track, it's a lot harder to traverse now. Uh, I mean, I had to fight with the goofy politicians uh, in Cook County. Uh, I remember I started in Morton Grove and uh, one guy that gave me uh, the idea, I, I ought to get out of there, uh, some uh, plump guy with a soggy cigar came through the door and in my little industrial slum in the beginning, uh, he was right at my desk pretty soon and he said, you got a bad ventilation problem here right before Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, and so he said that three or four times, and I said, I don't know what you mean by that, <laughs> but I don't have any money. <laughs> and, I, and I don't have any time for you. Please leave. <laughs> he was a factory inspector. Uh, uh, later on, a real factory inspector came by. He says, oh, that guy was freelancing. This is <laughs> This is his territory. But, it got worse, uh, and luckily I got out of Cook County where the maniacs have been running it for too long. Go back to when I started this thing, I couldn't sell anything, and so I had to learn to sell. I traveled, uh, this guy gave me free play. I could uh, I travel the country. They didn't have credit cards then, but I got an ATC card. He had to deposit what would be $5,000 today. I could fly anywhere. So I went to every aviation company in the thing, I only reported to this guy every three months, and uh, he let me spend anything I wanted, and uh, and I didn't spend much at all. Uh, I was as tight. I'm a depression baby. I was tight about it, but I went to every place and talked to the uh, chief uh, electrical engineer and the chief buyer of electronic stuff, and uh, in every aircraft company there was, and uh, so I found out that what Mr. Ames wanted me to do was impossible that it, there wouldn't be a market for it. Uh, things had gone past uh, the technology that he was at first interested. So I came back and started designing things and uh, tooling them up and getting out and, and selling them myself. I learned to sell. But one thing I had to do was uh, get a, I subscribed to Sales Management Magazine. And in the back end of it, there were statistics about uh, where industry was in the United States. And uh, I can tell you, it was stuck in my memory, is that Cook County had twice the manufacturing stature, size, dollars of any other county in the United States. They led in 10 industries from railroads and steel through furniture, electronics, clothing, 10 different industries. Chicago and Cook County were the biggest by twice 
of any other county in the United States. The state of Illinois, there were only 48 states then, not the 57 Obama has found. <laughs> oh, what a guy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I lost track here somewhere. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I can remember all of that. I could pick up the telephone. And being a, I was 25 when I started that thing. And I could pick up the phone and find anybody in this immediate area that was an expert at any kind of tooling or materials or anything else you want. On the other end of the phone was an expert would be glad to talk to you. It was a wonderful place to do business. Just terrific. Uh, and it isn't anymore. Uh, when I look at the regulations that are thrown at us in business, hell, I, I got a uh, hundred million dollar a year business now, and I got 600 people, and we're really swinging, and we're profitable and all that. So I can fight these bastards with all of their, their stinking regulations. But it really burns me up to think what I went through is much worse now with these pile of regulations. The regulations you've got for every blasted thing you want to do in your lives or your business. There are the 10,000 cuts of Marxism that they have put right on us with their stinking regulations. That is, they've put it in place without a name on it. And that's what we've got to face with. Think about the regulations. They make laws downstate. Properly so in some cases. And uh, you have to obey the law. And uh, in general, the law says you can swing your fist wherever you want until you encounter somebody's nose. That's a good law. <laughs> and, 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 and I can work with things like that. <laughs> Am I funny? <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. That's OK. But regulations really stink because uh, some unelected Oh, I don't know what name I want to call him, <laughs> but uh, decides to pass a regulation about the size of the risers, the diameter of the, of the, of the handles, and uh, every blasted damn detail about everything you do with the building. Somebody is put in a stinking bokeh building code, and uh, there are just so many of those regulations, it's hard to go anywhere. So these are all put in by um, some Appalachian. Uh, <laughs> in the towns and counties and so forth, and they put all those regulations in, they're worse than a law. Because these twits won't let you go ahead until you said, well, I want to do something under section A, B, 71, 6, 22, 8. And, uh, oh, let's see, there's a fee for $100 for asking if I can do that. <laughs> yeah, so they get you, boom, there's a fee, not a tax. And, uh, and if you screw up, boom, there's, you know, they're going to come along and inspect you. And uh, it'll be their idea whether you've got to tear out the driveway to see whether you put enough concrete in under it. Uh, they go on and on with this crap. There's no end to it. Who elected them to bind us up with a bunch of regulation? Yeah. That's your yeah. it's, It is the... Socialism of the 10,000 cuts. And uh, there's no name to it, and nobody's thinking about it. Uh, they're thinking about the stinking Obama thing. And I'll tell you something about that. Uh, in 1933, I was 10 years old, and uh, my dad uh, was a uh, salesman for uh, millwork. Uh, nobody had any medical insurance. and. Uh, Anyway, uh, I, my appendix ruptured before anybody knew I was sick. I went into a coma for two weeks. Some people say I'm still in it. <laughs> but, I'm not. <laughs> but um, you know, I was six weeks in the hospital. And uh, obviously, I did mostly recover from that. And, um, it has something to say about America. Uh, when that stinker Obama said that you couldn't get medical help unless you had a, a, a federal plan, um, he sure in hell didn't know much about America. <laughs> Walk out of this building and pretend you had too much beer and fall on the cement and see how long it takes somebody to find you and pick you up. 
I mean, you better go to a desolate spot or you're going to be picked up in five minutes and they're, they're going to do something for you. If you do it on West Madison Street, is the Harbor Light Mission still there? Uh, you're going to get three hots and a cot in a damned hurry. Uh, no matter what happens to you, just drunk or ill, some American's going to come along and take care of you. Even if it means he takes you home. That's the kind of country we really got. Still, that's in the hearts of people. We're Americans. And we can handle that and we help each other. I, I wrote a list of 18 different ways you get medical help without the stinking federal government being responsible for it. And there's all kinds, but uh, the first one on the list is your family. You know, when our family uh, was really more extent and more prevalent, uh, you had to keep your nose clean or your family might uh, give you a little lip about it. I got the nose and the lip into it. <laughs> but so you had to keep your reputation clean with your own family and you got some kind of morality and responsibility in doing that. But you, regardless of which way it was, your family helped you out as they did when I damn near died uh, from that. The uh, treacherous disease I had was before they had penicillin or any of those things that would have cured it more easily. But uh, your family is the first level of it. There's other things to do. You know, whenever you got a, a sniffle or you think maybe your leg's broken, call Google, for Christ's sake. There's everything on there. Google will tell you all about your ailment. And before you go to the doctor, Google it. Because yeah. the doctor isn't allowed to Google you and your disease or take anything that might be nature's remedy or anything from Google or anything that isn't in the New England Journal of Medicine. Because if he does do that, uh, he's going to get sued. Uh, you know, doctors are stuck. All of their clients are in trouble and, you know, more or less on one or two or ten steps on the way to the graveyard. So he's got tough clients that are already in trouble. And some stinking lawyer if it doesn't all come out right, it's going to sue him, unless he marches in that very narrow line. That's not fair. And the first step towards reducing uh, the cost of medicine and, and to get better care is to get rid of the crazy lawyers that class action suits him. Yeah. Do you want to come up here? No. <laughs> <laughs> they just say get the lawyers out of the schools, too. Yeah. They cause more trouble than anything. Yes, they do. No, the lawyers, uh, I mean, there's good lawyers. I've, I've got several of them. Well, here's mine. one right here, Jack. Don't forget me. <laughs> there you go. There's many there's really good lawyers. And, and uh, I, I do use them for various things. Uh, but uh, that uh, ilk that's like that, what was the name of the fellow that ran for president? Edwards? Yeah. That's slimy, no good, that's so good. <laughs> And he had enough money out of those lawsuits to run for president? Oh, no. That's not right. That's not good, and we ought to get rid of it. But Obama sure in hell won't get rid of it, because that's a lot of what pumps the money into him. The same thing is true of Madigan downstate. I pushed on with this stuff here, and I want to get down to the practical thing of these good guys that are running for office here in Illinois. Uh, we really need it, folks. Um, I've started, uh, being that uh, my son Tom's doing a better job of running auto engineering than I could do myself, uh, for quite some time I've been building a political enterprise, uh, and it's got several legs. Uh, there, there's the uh, Republican Renaissance PAC. That's a state PAC. We can get in the mud and wrestle with the pigs in mm -hmm. politics, and we're not rich people standing behind a, a, a fence and throwing snowballs out there, uh, which uh, I decry uh, the rich people that can't get their hands dirty, get into real politics with real people, and find out what in hell's going through their heads and hands. Uh, you can't do politics at a distance. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, but uh, anyway, we've got that set up. I've also got uh, championnews.net, uh, which is a profit and loss online newspaper. I can say anything I want in politics. What is it again, sir? Uh, uh, championnews.net. That's a profit and loss newspaper. I can talk politics, anything I want at any level, and uh, the people that read it and comment in it 
uh, can do that. And uh, it's getting a, a growing uh, bunch of people that uh, come to it. It's 8 to, eight to 9 o'clock on uh, uh, Sunday mornings. Uh, here we are. Thank you, more. Uh, but uh, I'm not trying to drum up business to it because it's a, it's a profit and loss thing throwing a loss. But uh, <laughs> that and one other organization I have is the uh, Family Taxpayer Foundation. I've had that about 15 years. That's a 501c3. And uh, with that, uh, people can contribute to it, and it's t t it's, uh, uh, you can have a tax credit on it. And, uh, and what does it do? What it do does is it's, I've been fighting this business on education. Uh, his remarks that he made about our lousy education. Uh, listen, I've been, a, I've been a, a, a skunk at a picnic for 40 years with, the, with these school districts. Uh, the temperature in the room drops 20 degrees when I walk. <laughs> It's true. Uh, there is an awful lot wrong. The, the K-12 school system of Illinois is the worst run organization there is in the whole state, bar none. There's nothing that big, and that screwball run. <laughs> I could give you a chapter and verse on that part, because uh, talking about the quality of education, uh, there's a subjectivity about that. You can have different opinions about what constitutes good education. But you can't have different opinions about the fact that I'll put a roof that's leaking on one of my factory buildings for $5, and the idiots over at the school district that I'm in with District 300, and about every other one in the state, are going to pay $16 a square foot, not five. Uh, that's what they do. How do men do they do that? Uh, there's all kinds of tricks in this thing. I've uh, seen school districts uh, claiming that it would cost $22 a square foot to put a repair of the roof on a grammar school. They're insane. Uh, here in Barrington, where I live, uh, uh, recently uh, District 220 uh, bought a, uh, a lousy building that had been sitting empty a long time, and uh, they fixed it up for early childhood uh, learning. And, uh, you know, in, in fact, what the hell does Barrington need with early childhood? Educate. These kids have had their feet under the breakfast tables of rich folks uh, for all their young lives. They'll learn more there than they're going to learn in the first five years in, in the Barrington schools. But uh, they've got a building like that, and they fixed it up, to, and I think it was a cost of uh, some $11 million. That's uh, $308 a square foot. I'll build them a brand new, better building with a high floor load and air conditioning and lights and everything better than what they got for about a dollar, $130 a square foot, not $308. There's, that's the difference between doing it with a bunch of um, people that don't know a damn thing about running anything, whether it's the uh, salaries, the pensions, or the cost of the roofs. Uh, take a look in their dumpsters. They're full of good things that normal people would never throw away. For 15 years, I've been publishing the salaries and pensions of all the teachers and uh, the uh, so-called uh, <laughs> management, mis no, the mismanagement. We've got to call it what it is. The mismanagement of the K-12 system. And uh, uh, a fellow named Bill Zettler started reading into it and writing articles from it about six years ago. And uh, he's, he's a genius of a writer. And uh, a little over a month ago, I asked him to take his 150 articles uh, and, uh, that he's written for Champion News and uh, put them into a book. So that's what he did. And uh, this is the book. And uh, you can get this on the internet. Amazon.com or, or Champion News. Amazon. Yeah, Amazon.com or Champion News .net. Yeah, uh, every one of you ought to buy this and stuff it up the snoot of your local <laughs> school district. <laughs> and anywhere you open it, you're going to see some, I just opened it casually. There's a bunch of figures. Don't get scared. Uh, and then there's something over here. Uh, there's uh, not quite a number of chapters in here, and every one of them is a short story. You can open this book and, and read that chapter. It's going to it'll compel you to read the whole chapter because it. Uh, Zetler is a good writer, and every one of these is a short story. And the facts are there, and the salaries are on the 
championnews.net site. Uh, the horrors in this thing are beyond belief. Uh, let me take you on one simple little quick tour would be the pay and pensions of the superintendents of the school district. Now, first of all, uh, you know, school district's got a big budget. You know, it'll be <laughs> some 50 or 100 million bucks. It's big business, all right. But uh, the superintendent is not a big businessman. First of all, uh, this big businessman doesn't have a sales department. Uh, his sales manager is a truant officer. All his customers must come there, yeah, must go there, yeah, and be treated there. So uh, that's taken care of. Uh, the salaries of all of his employees are not determined by uh, the superintendent. They're determined by the teachers' union, largely, and the uh, school board that the teachers' union elected. Try and get elected to the school board. Tough job. It's uh, at least as tough as uh, getting elected to the senator of the house downstate. And that's because the teachers' union, I will paint as the biggest villain of all. But that's, uh, oh my, uh, what else is, about, is it about? Oh, he never gets to fire anybody. Uh, you've got uh, 860 school districts in the state of Illinois. You'd think these guys would know how to do something, and, and they're all doing the same damn thing. Not well, but they're doing this the same. And, uh, you think that they could do that. Well, uh, he can't fire anybody and he doesn't really hire anybody. He can choose what ones come by, but once he's got them, he can't do anything about it except rotate them among the different schools in the district. Uh, it's kind of a pathetic performance. Mm -hmm. your, uh, your average uh, 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 superintendent is uh, just a well-dressed uh, fellow chumming the waters from a more tax raise. That's his big job, uh, and uh, they're pretty good at doing that. Uh, the fellows in, uh, in District two, uh, 300, which is the third biggest district in the state outside of Chicago or a big city, uh, I'm talking to him and uh, his very fancily dressed uh, lady of uh, uh, finance, uh, incidentally, you can't be hired as an excellent dressed lady of finance until you got an education degree. So they have shut off all of the fine managers of finance. You can find all through the state that have been living in a business. They can't work for a school district. They've got to have uh, a certificate. And with that, you can get them in there. Now, I've asked them what they uh, thought the raises were that they'd given the people during the union contract of three years. Because I got all this stuff in my thing. I, I can tell uh, how many people actually were there for three years in a school district. And uh, that's about 75% of them. Anybody gets those cushy jobs, it's going to stay there. And uh, so they did. And I said, how much were your raises uh, for each of the three years? And he's, he and the fancily dressed lady of finance said 4% 4 4 each year. Um, uh, well, and this is a little funny because the people who were there for the three years, their wages went up an average 35%. That's something like, uh, uh, 10 compounded was, you know, it was 10% a year, not four. How do you count for that? <laughs> it's only four. You couldn't get these guys to come off of four. They said it verbally, they said it in writing, they said it everywhere, and they say it with a smile, and the damn fools think they're running the school district. They don't even know the cost of their own labor. Uh, you know, in, in business, uh, anybody that found you doing that, uh, you wouldn't be there the rest of the day. Uh, there'd be two guards get you by the elbows and get you out before you were certified crazy. <laughs> These guys are really abusive. Now that, one more thing about that superintendent. Uh, he was making a, around $200,000 a year on the job. And so he got to retire just after age 55. Well, he never did any heavy lifting, so he's going to live to 85 or 90. And he, there's going to be a new one issuing about every five years. So now we've constructed a parade. We got a guy in the job, and you got six or seven of them stretched out uh, from 55 to 85 is 30 years. I mean, six are on a pension, and one's actually so-called working. So there's seven of them, and they're all earning $200,000 a year because the ones that are retired, it's going up 3% a year, which compounds out there too. 
So what you've got is seven guys not on the job and one guy on the job, and they're all making about $200,000 a year. Um, eight times 200 is how much, folks? <laughs> it's a lot more than $200,000. There's a great deal of money every year to keep that parade moving. And, it just, and to make that even scarier, there's 860 school districts in the state of Illinois. And that kind of crap is going on with the superintendent and the fancily dressed uh, woman of finance and the <laughs> principals and the, all of the other teachers that stayed there long enough and learned how to scam the system so that they could get um, a bigger than their salary pension. Imagine working for $200,000, getting a $200,000 pension. That's what's going on with it, and it's trouble. Now, uh, I'm going to speed through here. The next thing you got to do is do something about it. And what we've done is we have vetted uh, a group of about 50 people, primarily 25, that, we th that are vetted by us and so that we know what in hell the principles are that they stand for. And uh, uh, we figure with 25 uh, really good people like that and with support all around to get them elected, we will get six in the House and six in the, in the Senate, which will give us control of the House and Senate downstate and we can stop this crazy business that's going on, particularly with, this, with the school districts. Because this craziness with what's going on by the union, the union, I'll give you another figure and knock you off. Uh, the union, teachers union, the IEA, the Illinois Miseducation Association, which is a sh an offshoot of the NEA, which Forbes called back in 93, the National Extortion Association. <laughs> I, at that time in 93, I was already onto these rascals, and I bought a thousand copies of that particular article from Forbes magazine. I still have about five of them. But the, the graphs of the pay and the union involvement go up, and the achievement goes down. Those graphs are still heading that way. Uh, this thing has been uh, on the way for a long time. The NEA really has the uh, intent to educate your children to be good, quiet, to compliant socialists. That's yeah. pretty much their uh, declared uh, reason uh, for our existence. But anyway, uh, we can get rid of that union if we get six in the House, six in the Senate, and that's uh, the thing to do is to get these good people in there. And uh, we at, at uh, the Renaissance Pact have got this all packaged up with a picture of the uh, group of about 25 people plus more. Uh, we need uh, at least 25 to flip have a chance of flipping in order to get 12 that really do get there. We get six in each house, boom, we're gonna take over the legislature. Listen, we gotta do that. Any businessman, any family person, anybody who owns property, realize that our state is the most crooked state of the 50. Yep. Not the 57. And <laughs> it's not only the, the most crooked, it is the most broke. We're more broke than California, our credit rating is worse. We really stink by any measure. And who owns this thing? This thing? Well, the Democrats own it. it. It's owned by Madigan, he's been there 42 years. And this thing all stinks from what he has done. You've got a big mess on your hands, and we can't go through 12. I'm not gonna talk about who's gonna be governor uh, in 14 or anything like that. Uh, we've gotta get rid of this stinking lousy government in Illinois, we got to realize that the, the Democrat next door to you may be the nicest guy in the block, but you got to vote against every son of a bitch that wears a Democrat label because you got to go vote. The Democrats are the enemy. Even if they're a nice guy, they got to go because their first vote is going to be keep, keep Manigan in there. We can't afford that guy anymore. Uh, he's a curse. And uh, what goes with them with the Democrats is a curse. And we aren't gonna stop this thing until we take over both the House and the... Now, if we take over the House and Senate, then we're gonna have a lot of votes because Joe Walsh is over there. And uh, <laughs> that, will, that will help him and it will help the presidential candidate as well. So uh, there's a better speaker than I in the House, so I'm gonna... There's Joe Walsh. Thank you all.